So we're going to talk this morning about finances. And I really trust God that what we're going to share from His Word will bring liberty. It will bring breakthrough in your life. It will shift paradigms. And it will open up a new dimension in relation to finances and materialistic or material possessions rather in your life. So uh, last week you'll remember that we had a testimony service, those of you who were here. Um, many testimonies that many of the leaders gave about what God did in their lives uh, in relation to finances and, um, and, and material possessions. And uh, if you were not here, I really want to encourage you to go and go onto the recording to get the recording. It's also on the, on the WhatsApp group. I really believe this is something that God wants to do in our midst in this season. Um, many conversations out there uh, focus on the economy and patterns in the economy and concerns about the economy. But you know what? God works against the grain. Uh, our God is not dependent on the world system. Amen? And if God is stirring something in our midst around finances and from His Word around finances, it means that He wants to anchor us and stir up faith. Faith is by hearing, and hearing is through the Word of God. Amen? And so as we share our testimonies, as we share from the Word, especially in this time around finances, I want to ask you, won't you just please open up your heart and listen carefully what the Holy Spirit is saying to you specifically in your situation and what needs to shift in your situation because this might be crucial to reposition yourself and myself and, and us collectively in a way where God wants to take us from glory to glory and from strength to strength irrespective of what is happening in the, in the world out there. Amen? So, uh, so we're going to share uh, about uh, finances, tithing specifically. And um, I, I said in the, in the first sermon, this is really uh, one of those topics that you want to avoid as, as a preacher because it is controversial in some aspects and, um, and, and in a certain sense you open up yourself and you become very vulnerable when you start to share about topics like this. Uh, Kieran, I see you smiling. And, uh, but, but I also want to be obedient in this regard and um, I believe what we're going to share this morning is really going to bring liberty uh, in your life. When I prepared this morning and also prayed for the sermon uh, early this morning, um, I just experienced that God wants to bring breakthrough uh, in your life in the area of finances. Um, they might, some of you might sit here that are under intense financial constraint. Some of you might sit here, you need to make uh, financial decisions that has got an impact on your future and your family, and maybe some people that are also dependent upon your decisions, financial decisions. And I really trust God that He will come and deposit in your spirit certain principles from His Word that will position or reposition you in a way uh, where you can um, get the breakthrough that God wants uh, for you. So um, before I start to read from Genesis chapter 14, I just want to say that uh, for those of you who are taking notes, we're going to stand still and focus on sort of three core principles um, around tithing. And let me briefly mention those principles to you, and, and we're going to derive that predominantly from Genesis chapter 14. Um, the first uh, principle is a tithing in the context of harmony between heaven and earth. Let me repeat it again. Tithing in the context of harmony or alignment between heaven and earth. The second um, uh, point that we're going to focus on is tithing in the context of a godly priestly order. Tithing in the context of a godly priestly order. And thirdly, uh, tithing in the context of protection from temptation. Tithing in the context of protection from temptation. So the reason why I want us to um, start with Genesis is that Genesis is the book of beginnings. And um, Niku, oftentimes we get certain core concepts or core principles um, embedded in Genesis. And, and uh, what happens is, is it's sort of a blueprint or core principles are laid down in Genesis that carry through 
um, as a golden thread throughout the Bible. And uh, so for some examples of that is the concept of, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God. It is established right in Genesis where God says, let us make men in our image. And so in that, God is introducing the concept of, of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, Genesis 3 verse 15, uh, we talk about the mother promise where, um, where God says, um, and, and he speaks, he says to the serpent, you will, you will bite him at the heel, you will strike him at the heel, but he will crush your head. And in Genesis 3 verse 15 is the mother promise of Jesus Christ that will come and uh, gain victory on the cross of Calvary for us. And so many concepts about anthropology, um, sin, salvation, and so on is embedded in, in Genesis. In the same way, the concept around tithing is introduced in Genesis. And this is important for you to understand because one of the misperceptions is that tithing is part of the law. And, uh, but if we look um, uh, at Genesis 14, and we're going to stand still and, and talk a lot about Genesis 14, uh, uh, Abraham was way before uh, the, the law of Moses was introduced and the Levitical priest priesthood was introduced way before then. So the concept of tithing was established way before the law was introduced through Moses. Um, in actual fact, in, in um, Hebrews chapter 7, it says that the Levitical priesthood actually um, sort of gave tithe through Abraham because the Levit Levitical lineage was um, still in the body of Abraham. And, um, and so by Abraham giving tithe to Melchizedek, and we will talk about it later on, the whole Levitical priesthood and what happens around tithing under the law actually was subject to the principle of tithing that was established in, chap um, in Genesis chapter 14. So this is a very important, um, uh, a very important um, chapter uh, to open up the concept of tithing. And what I want to, uh, what I'm going to try to do is, I'm going to try to open up, I believe, a pattern that was laid down um, in chapter 14 and show how that pattern repeats itself around the concept of tithing. So we're going to um, start uh, to read from verse 17. And uh, before I read, I just want to create the historical context. So God called Abram from the, the country of Ur, uh, from uh, the, um, his father's um, um, land in the Chaldeans. And God called Abram. Abram was obedient. And this wonderful relationship, Abram is the father of faith, um, um, opens up in Genesis. And, um, and so in chapter 13, um, Abram and Lot, Lot is... Um, um, uh, Abram's nephew, his brother's child, he went along and um, there was some a scuffle between his shepherds and Lot's shepherds and they separated. Lot chose a specific piece of land and Abram um, got the other piece of land, actually the land that God promised to Abram and his descendants. And what happened to Lot, he went to stay in a place called Sodom. And uh, for those of you who know the Old Testament, that was a bad place. That was not the kind of place where you want to hang and so, but he went to stay in Sodom, and uh, uh, many other kings um, got together, and they waged war against the king of Sodom and other kings, and um, they conquered them. They took Lot and his family and his possessions captive, and, um, and they took them hostage um, up, up, up north to Damascus um, in the current Syria, way back up, and Aram got to know about it, and, and then um, in verse 13, Sorry, verse 14, it says, When Abraham heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abraham divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot, and his possessions together with the women and the other people. After Abram returned from defeating Kedor-Loamor and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. It's important, bread and wine, we'll speak about it later on. 
He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him, that is Melchizedek, a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread of the thong of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me to Aner, Ashkol, and Mamre. Let them have their share. And so let's start with the first first. Um, sort of concept that I want to focus on, and that is harmony, uh, tithes in the context of harmony between heaven and earth. Tithes in the context of harmony between heaven and earth. So this is the pattern that I believe is embedded in this account of what happened to Abraham. What we see is that Abraham and I'm going, I'm going to have three positions, one, two, and on the other side of the podium, three, in illustrating this pattern. What we see is that Abraham is moving with a certain strategy to go and rescue his nephew. And so he takes his men, he went up, up, up north, and he starts to execute a certain strategy, and he's successful in that. Right? He achieves victory, there's deliverance, there's protection, there is um, um, freedom that comes. And then it says, um, that, that um, and blessed be God, in verse 20, and blessed be God most high, listen carefully, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Now this is very interesting. Abram acts, but verse 20 says, who brought the delivery? God brought the delivery. I'm going to repeat it again. Abram acts, and God brings the delivery. So what Abram does and what God does is synchronized with one another. There's unity. And that brings the delivery and the freedom and the protection and the provision. Amen? So what opens up here is that, first of all, above everything else, Abram has got such a walk with God, established through the various chapters, there's such a harmony, a connection between his heart and God's heart, a synchronization between heaven and earth. So what, what Abram does is aligned with what is going on in God's heart. And when Abram acts in the physical, God acts in the spiritual. And that brings about breakthrough, provision, protection, deliverance. Can you see the pattern? Right. And then what is Abram's response when he gets all of the goods and the victory and everything? And Abram, it says in verse 20, And blessed be God most high who delivered your enemies into your hands. And it is as if Abram says, Yes, it is God who acted. God's hand was integrally involved in all of this. I acknowledge that. And then, stop number three, then Abram gave him, that's Melchizedek, we will speak about to him, but gave, Abram gave in a response and acknowledgement to God a tenth of what he gained from that. So the pattern is synchronization between heaven and earth. I'm positioned in such a way, the way I live, heart-to-heart -heart connection so that when I move, God moves, I'm a co-worker with him. And because there's alignment, 
there's breakthrough, provision, protection, and then there is an acknowledgement from Abram towards God that it was you. It comes from your hand. And the way in which he acknowledges God is by giving a tenth of what he received. Can you see the pattern? All right. Whoa, you are very quiet. Are you still here? Okay, so let's quickly go to Genesis 28. And I want to um, confirm the pattern that we see starting to emerge around the concept of tithing in Genesis chapter 14. The very same pattern repeats itself in uh, Genesis uh, chapter 28. So in Genesis chapter 28, Jacob leaves his father and his mother's house in obedience because um, his father and mother says you can't marry uh, uh, um, outside the, the um, covenant and the lineage. And so therefore you have to go to a place called Padam Aram and you have to um, Rebecca's um, um, uncle called Laban. And um, so they said, Becky said to Abe, we're going to send Jacob. And, um, and Jacob says, yes, it's fine. So he came to a place called Luz, Luz, L-U-Z, and, um, and there he, he sleeps on a, uh, on a stone. I really don't know how you sleep on a stone, but anyway, he did it. And then um, in, verse, um, in verse 10, it says, uh, Jacob left Beersheba and set out uh, for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set, taking one of the stones there. He put it under his uh, head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream uh, in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching the heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. Isaac. Um, I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and the east, uh, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I'm with you. I will watch over you um, wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. I was not aware of it. Um, he says it's awesome. And, um, and then he says in, in verse um, 17, he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And so early the next morning, he took the stone um, and he made a pillar of it. He poured oil over it. And then in verse 20, uh, 20 he says, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and I will watch over me uh, and will watch over me uh, on this journey, I'm taking, uh, um, I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house. Then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Now get the pattern. Jacob is lying down, and heaven's open, heaven opens up. There's an open heaven over him. In actual fact, he sees a ladder with angels climbing up and down. And so there's a direct connection between heaven and earth because of the covenant, right? Not because of what he did, but because of the covenant. But the principle is this synchronization in the way in which Jacob positioned himself between heaven and earth, up to the point where Jacob says, well, this is so amazing. There's such an open heaven. This is called the gate of heaven, right? It's a highway, and I'm going to call this place the house of God, Bethel. And by the way, the previous name, Luz, was called separation. Now it's called unity between myself and God. And out of this place, God says, Jacob, you're going to be blessed. 
Because there's this connection between heaven and earth in the special kind of relationship that we have, and I'm in your midst, there will be, there will be a legacy, there will be a blessing, there will be protection, there will be provision. This will flow as a result of my connection, of the connection that you and I have in this covenant. There will be, there will be a legacy and a blessing and protection. And then Jacob says, well, God, if this is true, then I'm going to acknowledge you and I'm going to give a tenth of what you give to me as a way to honor you on what you've given me because I'm acknowledging that it comes from your hand. Can you see the pattern, how it repeats itself? And so this pattern is important because this is, I believe, what God lays down in relation to the concept of of tithing. And as we go on, this pattern will be, um, will be important for you to understand and, and replace or reframe rather some of the misperceptions that you might have formed in your mind around tithings and tithing in, uh, in the body uh, of Christ or, or, or what we need to do. So if you can turn in your Bibles, and that's the last portion on this point in the Old Testament on on tithing, Malachi chapter th 3, Malachi chapter 3, and um, in Malachi chapter 3, this is the classic verse that many people recite when they talk about tithing, and, um, and so of course we're going we're gonna to stop here, and um, if, you, if, if we can read from verse 6 on, verse 7 onwards. So in verse 7, chapter 3, verse 7, Malachi chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Now listen carefully. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a man rob God? Yes, you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not cast uh, their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Um, right, okay, so I'm just going to stop there. Oftentimes, we use the scripture and we say, well, God says that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a command. Uh, God wants us to give tithes. And, um, and, and in a certain sense, that's true. But we start at the wrong point. The point where we need to start is where God says in verse 7, Return to me, and I will return to you. So what does God say? We start with reciting the scripture here, with a tithing. God says, no, no, no. It starts in verse 7, return to me. Get your heart connected with my heart. Get the alignment and the synchronization right here. That's the pattern. Get heart-to-heart -heart connection accurate. Then the things will flow because you're accurately aligned. And then you need to acknowledge me. The problem is your heart is so disconnected from me it shows, yeah, that you're not giving your tithes. Can you see the pattern? And so, in a certain sense, tithing is a test that tells you and me where our heart is. It shows you, it's a barometer to show you how connected and aligned is your heart with God's heart or not. Do you know, oftentimes the funny thing is, when I start in my heart to struggle with tithing, 
It is in times when my heart is not close to God's heart. Then it becomes an issue. And oftentimes in my, since Bible school and, and years in ministry, in part-time ministry, the people that wants to make an issue and a theological issue out of tithing, the question is not so much about tithing. The question is, how connected is your heart with God's heart? Because you know what, and I said that last week in my testimony as well, when a guest of honor comes into my house and I offer tea and coffee, I take the tray first of all to the guest of honor and I say, you have first, you take first. It's a way of honoring. In the very way, same way, if my heart is with God's heart, the way in which I honor him month after month after month when I sit behind that EFT is to say, God, you take first. You're the guest of honor in my life, and I honor you through my materialistic things. So yes, God says in Malachi, sort of in an instructive way, take your full tithe to the storehouse. Why does God say that? Because he meets them here where the problem is. And he says, take the tithe and steer your heart back to my heart. It is as if Matthew, Matthew 6 verse, um, verse 19 to, to 21, um, Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So do you know that you can steer your heart with your materialistic things? Just put your treasure in the right place. So if your heart is disconnected from God, tithing is the tool that you can use to steer your heart back, to align your heart with God's heart, that there's synchronization between heaven and earth. Does that make sense? Isn't God awesome? Now we want to make it this law and this theological thing and so on. You know what? It's just a tool that God gives you to put your heart in the right place and to steer your heart in the right place so that you are aligned with his heart. We will now look at other strategies from the enemy. But that your heart is aligned with his heart, that there's an open heaven, a gate of heaven, that there's a download from heaven in terms of protection, provision, word, that there might be food in my house. What is the food? The word of God is richly in my house. There's a download from heaven. And then automatically the other things will flow. So tithing is not a trick where you can trick God and just, you know, I give my tithe and now the heaven will open. No. It shows you where your heart is and it helps you to keep your heart in the right place. Amen? Can you see this pattern? And so um, and that's the first principle that oftentimes speak still speak very hard to me and I have to use that continuously because I'm human in my own life. Tithing in the context of harmony between heaven and earth. So the second principle is tithing in the context of a godly priestly order. Tithing in the context of a godly priestly order. So let, let's go back to Genesis chapter 14. And so it says that... Um, Then Melchizedek, verse 18, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, that is the old name for Jerusalem, and Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him, meaning Melchizedek, a tenth, of everything. So the principle here is that tithing, uh, there's a certain protocol in giving tithing. Tithing is not just you, you give it everywhere. If you really want to um, give tithing accurately, there's a certain protocol. And tithing is always given within a specific priestly order. Tithing is given within a specific priestly order. And the priestly order that's introduced here is the order of Melchizedek. 
So let's just quickly go to Hebrews chapter 7. Um, Hebrews chapter 7, and I'm reading from verse 1. It will start to make sense now. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God. So um, um, it speaks about Christ as, uh, or Melchizedek as a type of the priestly um, order of Jesus Christ. So this Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God most high. He met Abram returning from defeat of the kings and blessed him, and Abram gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means a king of peace, without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life. Like the Son of God, he remains priest forever. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abram gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now, the law requires descendants of Levi because the priests to collect the tenth from the people that is the brothers, even though the brothers are descendants from Ab um, Abram. This man, however, did not trace his descendant from Levi, yet he collected the tenth from Abram and blessed him who had the promise. And without doubt, the lesser person is blessed by the greater. In the one case, the tenth is collected by men who die, but in the other case, by, by him who is declared to be living. That's Jesus Christ. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abram, because when Melchizedek met Abram, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. What does this mean? This wonderful connection, this accurate connection between heaven and earth, where my heart is connected with God's heart, where there's a gateway of heaven and a download from heaven in terms of God's voice and his word and his blueprint patterns that leads me and guides me. That relationship is not cheap. It's bought with a price. It's mediated through a priestly order by Jesus Christ. I'm going to say it again. Well, let me approach it from a different angle. You and I are both sinful human beings. We've messed up. We were part of the big crash in the Garden of Eden. We've got a sinful nature and our sin separated us from God. You agree? In order to position us and to give us the legal right to have this relationship with God, we had to have a high priest that was willing to pay the price and to give the ultimate sacrifice. So chapter 9 in Hebrews, you can go and read it, speaks about Jesus Christ was our ultimate high priest that went not once a year with the blood of, of animals, but with his own blood once and for all into the heavenly, um, into the heavenlies where, where God is, into the most holy place, and he offered atonement for my sin and your sin. The ultimate, ultimate priest, high priest Jesus Christ paid, and he opened up this way, this priestly order of Jesus Christ opened up the way that we can have this relationship with God. It gave us the legal right to have that relationship with God. Even more, and that's in chapter 8, it speaks about how the covenant, how the blood of Christ opened up a special kind of relationship with the king of kings called the covenant. So whenever God relates to human beings, it's according to certain criteria, and that criteria is embedded in the concept of a covenant. It's not just any relationship, it's a covenant relationship. And covenant means that the way in which you clinch a covenant is always with blood. The Hebrew word literally means you cut a covenant. And through the blood of Christ, you and I enter into a covenant with God. Do you know what that means? There's a huge difference between a contract and a covenant. So if Dr. Blessing and I enter into a contract, it means that he's got certain roles and responsibilities and I've got certain roles and responsibilities. We put that into a contract and we sign it. He signs and I sign. And when I break my part of the contract, 
the contract is broken, he's free to go. All right, he doesn't have to keep his part of the bargain anymore because the contract is broken. A covenant is different. I'm in a covenant with my wife. A covenant means that even if Siobhan does nothing of her part, I'm still obliged to give 100% of my part. It can't be broken. It means that my resources, my strength, my abilities, everything that belongs to me now belongs to her. My enemies are her enemies. Her enemies are, metaphorically speaking, I don't have enemies, but you get what I'm saying. All right. It also means in the biblical context of covenant that we exchange identity, we exchange names, we exchange weapons. Her strength is my strength, my strength is her strength. That is what happened when John Dean and Nadia got married. How many months ago? Almost two months ago. Woo All right. But that, that happened in the spiritual realm when they entered into that covenant. Right. Now you understand why God says it's not two anymore, it's one. Right. So what he, what, when we start to talk about the priestly order of Melchizedek and we read chapter 8 of Hebrews, it means that through Jesus' blood, Nico, you and I now have this right to enter into a covenant with God through Jesus Christ. That's amazing. Because when we give our tithes, we give it into this priestly order. Do you know what it means? It means the following. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 14. It gets better and better. All right? You are in, you are, you are in a winning deal here, let me just say. So it says that, Blessed be Abram, um, Okay, so, so then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. <laughs> Isn't this amazing? Just think, now this is a couple of thousand years before Jesus Christ, but what does he do? He brings out bread and wine. Does, what, what does that mean? It means even then he acknowledges what Jesus Christ, the ultimate high priest, priestly king will do, right? So he ministers to Abram, bread and wine, and he positions him right at the right place. And then he says that um, bread and wine, he was priest of God most high, and he blessed Abram, saying, blessed be Abram by God most high. Now, let me just pause there. This is a moment. You can't lose this. When did he bless him? Before Abram gave the tithe or afterwards? Are you sure? Are you 100% sure? You're absolutely right. You need to get this. Abram was blessed in this covenant even before he gave the tithe. Now, I pause here for a moment because there is a false and a wrong perception that you have to give your tithe because, and then God will bless you. No, 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 no. It doesn't work like that. God is 100% faithful in his covenant re relationship with you. Your identity is that you are already blessed because of what Jesus Christ did for you. The tithe is an acknowledgement that God is a good God. And that His character does not change even if you change. He remains faithful even if I am faithful. And it's a way of worshiping, of acknowledging God for who He is and what He does in my life. Amen. Amen. Reinhard Bonker explained this concept so amazingly. He uh, once quoted that scripture in, in James chapter 1, that, uh, where, where it says that every good gift comes from God, from the God of lights. My Bible is falling. From the God of lights, um, who does not change like shifting shadows. Have you read that? Have you read that? All right. What is, and so Reinhard Bonker asked God, well, God, what does this mean? What does the scripture mean? And so on. And God, God reminded him of the sundial. Um, you know, those old, old Roman um, sun watches, the sundial, where there's that copper sort of fin that stands up and, and how the sun shifts. It casts a shadow and it shows you the time. Have you seen that? All right. It's called the sundial. And God says, to Reinhard Bonke, I'm always at 12 o'clock. 
I'm not changing. There's no shifting shadows in my character. I don't change. I don't move. I'm positioned right above you. I'm shining my favor right over you continuously. Even if you are unfaithful, I remain steadfast in my faithfulness towards you. I'm positioned right above you, and I'm shining down, right down on you. I'm not a God that shifts like shadows. I'm remaining above you. In this synchronization, I'm the one that remains steadfast, faithful. My character doesn't change. I remain faithful to the covenant. I will give my 100% even if you don't. I am there. I'm, my character is I'm a good God. And I give, give good gifts over my children continuously. And so when I give tithe, I give it into this priestly order that gives me the legal right to stand in this kind of relationship with an awesome God. And I'm blessed by that God. And it goes on, it says, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. That word creator also means possessor. It means that I am blessed in this covenant by the one who owns cattle on a thousand hills the gold and the silver belongs to him I'm his child and I'm standing in an awesome relationship with him and through Jesus Christ I'm seated in heavenly places I am blessed beyond measure and when I give my tithe into this priestly order that's where I position myself and that's what I acknowledge and that's what I confirm and that is where I align my heart with his heart so that I am aligned with his plan and his purposes and his will. Isn't that amazing? It's a tool to steer my heart to be aligned with what Jesus Christ did for me and what God wants to do in and through my life. Amen. So you are blessed, my brother and my sister, not because of a trick, but because of how good God is. Amen. And so, um, <laughs> where am I now in my notes? Um, yeah, so let me just end off by saying that if, if um, I wrote down here, maybe I should end off this point just with Romans 8 verse 31 and 32. It says, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? In this priestly order of Melchizedek, Christ gave his everything to make this alignment and this synchronization possible. How much more? That was the theme of last week's sermon, the testimony sermon. How much more will God not give you graciously Tomorrow, and this week, and next week, and next month, and 2024, and for your children when they are older. How much more will God not remain faithful in your life? But your problem and my problem is that we allow the world and everything in the world and fear and greed and everything else to pull our hearts away from this position of synchronization and alignment. And that's where the problem comes in. Amen. And in God's grace, he gives us this test to test our hearts, to measure our hearts, this barometer. And he also gives us this tool to steer our hearts called tithing in a place of honor and alignment. Amen. Can you see this? So let's talk about, let's move then to the last point. And the last point is tithing in the context of protection, protection. Protection against temptation. So we're going back to, um, to uh, Genesis chapter 14. And it says that, um, okay, then Abram gave him Melchizedek, the tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. Right? But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the thong of sandals, so that you will never be able to say, 
I made Abram rich. You will never be, be able to say that I am your source. Worldly system, you will never be my source. God is my source, the king of heaven and earth is my source. I will not position myself in a way where I will make anything else my source. This is actually what Abram says to him. You will never be able to say, I've made Abram rich. Um, I will accept nothing but my men who have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me, they can have their share. What does Abram say? In a certain sense, what, what I want to lift, what I want to underline here is the mere act of Abram giving his tithe and giving acknowledgement to God through giving his tithe positioned him in a way where he acknowledged God as his source, and that became the antidote against other things, the worldly system that could pull his heart away from an awesome God of love. Right? So, let me put it differently. I need to tithe to protect myself. Alan, inside of me, there's something that likes money. I like a lot of money. I like it a lot. I like a big, fat bank account. And you know what? I want to get more and more and more. And the more I get, the, the nicer I feel. There's something inside of me called greed. Go and read, go and read Galatians chapter 5, and you will find out it's also in you. We call it your sinful nature. There's something inside of me that must be crucified. But I can't move away from the fact that there's something inside of me called a sinful human nature that I have to crucify, that's crucified with Christ. But there's something in my sinful nature that's greedy, that likes money and more and more and more money. It's like a magnet. The problem is, in the world system, there's also a magnet, right, that pulls me and that say. YouTube and TikTok and Facebook marketing and all the things. This is how you're going to be successful. This is what you need to have. And these two magnets pull on one another. And you know what? Before I know it, it pulls my, my, it pulls my heart away from this connection between heaven and earth, this alignment that we spoke about, where my source is. It pulls my heart away if I allow that and, yeah, it pulls me over the edge where I will get hurt. It pulls me away from this. I need to tithe. I need to tithe. I need to tithe because very practically it breaks that thing in my life. It's protection to tithe. You know what? Can I make a confession, Alan? Sometimes I don't want to tithe. Because I'm, I can also make the calculations. I can work Excel. I'm very good with Excel. I can make the calculations and I can work out what I can do with the tithe that I'm giving away. And then I have to discipline myself to say, you know what, dear dear? You are not your own source. You are not your own source. It's not your, your intelligence or your giftings or anything. It's God's hands working with you that gives you the ability to do what you have to do. And at least he's keeping his bargain. At least the least that you can do is acknowledging him through this. It breaks that cycle of greed in my life. And it keeps me intact. I need it. I even want to go so far to say God doesn't need your tithe. You need to tithe to protect yourself and to protect your heart. And so... This is a stern warning from me. 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 says, remember, he's talking to Kanarkis van die Heere, die so, says the following, 1 Timothy 6 verse 10, but if we have food and clothing, 
we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. Listen carefully. For the love of money, the love of money, not money, money is just a means of exchanging stuff, but the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. In 1 John 2, it talks about the magnet in the world that pulls me. 1 John 2 verse 15 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of the eyes, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook marketing, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. It's real. It's there. Go and ask Gehazi in the Old Testament that walked with one of the biggest prophets that walked on this earth, saw many miracles that you and I would love to see. Missed it. Got leprosy. Why? Because of the love of money. He allowed the things of this world, these two magnets, to pull his heart away from what God had for him. Go and ask Judas. A man that walked with Jesus Christ, ate with him around the same table, slept with him in the same room, moved with him, talked to him like you and I are talking. Love of money. Missed it. Allowed that thing, those two magnets, to pull his heart away from this harmony between heaven and earth. Go and ask Ananias and Sapphira in Acts. Part of the New Testament church. Amazing thing happening. Holy Spirit being poured out. Miracles happening. Two magnets pull their hearts away. I need this antidote. I need this thing, this tool that God gave me to steer my heart and to put my heart, to keep my heart in the right place. Protect your heart again above everything else because out of it is the wellsprings of life. I need to keep this alignment in this pattern <clears throat> and the test and the tool that God gives me is tithing. It's not about a law. It's about a heart of a father that loves you so much that knows you need to protect your heart and you need this alignment because in this alignment, in this alignment, there's download from heaven. There's strategy like Abram received to, to get the victory. There is breakthrough. There is protection. There is provision if this alignment is accurate. That is what last week's sermon was all about. It was about testimonies where in our in our um, onful mark date, in our um, human failure, what we do, brokenness, God still remains faithful and there's testimony when that, that connection is there. So brother and my sister, I believe this is what the pattern and the concept, the biblical concept of tithing is all about. I believe it's an acknowledgement of a loving father who's intimately involved in every aspect of your life and who remains faithful. I believe it's a test that can show you, you and me, where our heart is. And I believe it's a tool to steer our hearts and to keep our hearts in the right place. God has got amazing things for you. God wants to speak to you this morning when I prepared for the sermon and prayed for you that will attend it, for you that will listen to the recording. I really just experience and I pray and I trust God that, that as you take hold of these truths, God will, God will open up a new dimension where, where you will get solutions and strategies and, and wisdom from God that where, where you will just be astounded by the breakthroughs that God's going to bring to you. I know some of you are sitting here and you say, Vipia, 
if I give my tithe, I, I won't have enough money to pay all the bills at the end of the month. Or even worse, if I pay my tithe, I won't even have food. I don't know where I will buy my food or food for my children. Some of you are in that situation. And I can just testify out of my life and Siobhan's life, out of our lives, there were times where we were also in that boat. But you know, God is honored by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. If you take all of this truth and, and you step out in faith, we've got testimonies where, where, where we, when, we paid all our, when we paid the tithes and we paid all our bills, we had no money for groceries. Absolutely no money for groceries. And we had small children. But not one month, not one month did we go without food. I don't know how it happened, but God is faithful. He's always faithful. And so I just want to encourage you uh, through that. Just allow God to surprise you in, in such an awesome and a, and, and a wonderful way. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your heart of blessing, your heart of grace, your heart of provision. You're an awesome Father. We acknowledge that first of all this, this afternoon. You're an awesome Father. We honor you as an awesome Father. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of your word that set us free, that set us free from greed, that set us free from fear, that set us free from the worldly system that wants to drown us. Thank you, Jesus, for the price that you paid so that we can have this awesome covenant relationship with a loving Father that wants to be involved, that wants to protect, that wants to bless, that wants to provide, that wants to guide. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray for every person that's sitting here in front of me that might be anxious about finances, worried and stressed out, Lord, I pray for them. And Lord, I really pray that, that what we've shared out of your word, that your Holy Spirit will take that to, to break that cycle of fear and anxiety, and that, that, that pattern that, that swallows them up, Lord. Just come and set them free. I pray for a new freedom over the finances um, of people listening to the sermon. Lord, that you will step in and that your order will be established. Your order will be established in Jesus' name. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your protection. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for your blessing, Lord. Your rich, abundant blessing that you have poured out over each one of us in Jesus Christ. We thank you for that. We honor you for that in Jesus' name and in that name alone. Amen.